Hey boys and girls, we're back again to read the last part of Wonder. We're going to be reading the last section today. Um, it will be a little bit longer, but um, I hope you enjoy it. So we are on page 288 if you're following along in your book, and this chapter is titled The Last Precept. This was written on Mr. Brown's chalkboard when we walked into English class for the last time. Mr. Brown's June Precept. Just follow the day and reach for the sun. The Polyphonic Spree. Have a great summer vacation, Class 5B. It's been a great year and you've been a wonderful group of students. If you remember, please send me a postcard this summer with your personal precept. It can be something you made up for yourself or something you've read somewhere that means something to you. If so, don't forget the attribution, please. I really look forward to getting them. Tom Brown, 563 Sebastian Place, Bronx, New York, 10053. The Drop-Off. The graduation ceremony was held in the Beecher Prep Upper School Auditorium. It was only about a 15 minute walk from our house to the other campus building, but dad drove me because I was all dressed up and had on new shiny black shoes that weren't broken in yet, and I didn't want my feet to hurt. Students were supposed to arrive at the auditorium an hour before the ceremony started, but we got there even earlier, so we sat in the car and waited. Dad turned on the CD player and our favorite song came on. We both smiled and started bobbing our heads to the music. Dad sang along with the song. Andy would bicycle across town in the rain to bring you candy. Hey, is my tie straight, I said. He looked and straightened it a tiny bit as he kept on singing, and John would buy the gown for you to wear to the prom. Does my hair look okay, I said. He smiled and nodded. Perfect, he said. You look great, Augie. Via put some gel in it this morning, I said, pulling down the sun visor and looking in the little mirror. It doesn't look too puffy. No, it's very, very cool, Augie. I don't think you've ever had it this short before, have you? No, I got it cut yesterday. I think it makes me look more grown up, don't you? Definitely. He was smiling, looking at me, and nodding. But I'm the luckiest guy on the Lower East Side because I got wheels and you want to go for a ride. Look at you, Augie, I said, smiling from ear to ear. Look at you, looking so grown up and spiffy. I can't believe you're graduating from the fifth grade. I know, it's pretty awesome, right? I nodded. It feels like just yesterday that you started. Remember, I still had that Star Wars braid hanging from the back of my head? Oh my goodness, that's right, he said, rubbing his palm over his forehead. You hated that braid, didn't you, Dad? Hate is too strong a word, but I definitely didn't love it. You hated it. Come on, admit it, I teased. No, I didn't hate it, he smiled, shaking his head, but I will admit to hating that astronaut helmet you used to wear. Do you remember? The one Miranda gave me? Of course I remember. I used to wear that thing all the time. Goodness, I hated that thing. He laughed almost more to himself. I was so bummed when it got lost, I said. Oh, it didn't get lost, he answered casually. I threw it out. Wait, what, I said? I honestly didn't think I heard him right. The day is beautiful and so are you, he was singing. Dad, I said, turning the volume down. What, he said, you threw it out? He finally looked at my face and saw how mad I was. I couldn't believe he was being so matter-of-fact about the whole thing. I mean, to me, this was a major revelation, and he was acting like it was no big deal. Augie, I couldn't stand seeing that thing cover your face anymore, he said clumsily. Dad, I loved that helmet. It meant a lot to me. I was bummed beyond belief when it got lost. Don't you remember? Of course I remember, Augie, he said softly. Oh, Augie, don't be mad. I'm sorry. I just couldn't stand seeing you wear that thing on your head anymore, you know? I didn't think it was good for you. He was trying to look me in the eye, but I wouldn't look at him. Come on, Augie, please try to understand, he continued, putting his hand under my chin and tilting my face toward him. You were wearing that helmet all the time, and the real, real, real truth is, I miss seeing your face, Augie. I know you don't love it, don't always love it, but you have to understand, I love it. I love this face of yours, Augie, completely and passionately, and it kind of broke my heart that you were always covering it up. He was squinting at me like he really wanted me to understand. Does mom know I said? He opened his eyes wide. No way, are you kidding? She would have killed me. She tore the place apart looking for that helmet, dad. I said, I mean, she spent like a week looking for it in every closet, in the laundry room, everywhere. I know, he said, nodding. That's why she'd kill me. And then he looked at me and something about his expression made me start laughing, which made him open his mouth wide like he'd just realized something. Wait a minute, Augie, he said, pointing his finger at me. You have to promise me you will never tell Mommy anything about this. I smiled and rubbed my palms together like I was about to get very greedy. 
Let's see, I said, stroking my chin. I'll be wanting that new Xbox when it comes out next month. And I'll definitely be wanting my own car in about six years. A red Porsche would be nice. And he started laughing. I love it when I'm the one who makes Dad laugh, since he's usually the funny man that gets everybody else laughing. Oh boy, oh boy, he said, shaking his head. You really have grown up. That part of the song, or the part of the song we love to sing the most started to play, and I turned up the volume. We both started singing. I'm the ugliest guy on the Lower East Side, but I've got wheels and you want to go for a ride. Want to go for a ride, want to go for a ride, want to go for a ride. We always sang this last part at the top of our lungs, trying to hold that last note as long as the guy who sang the song, which always made us crack up. While we were laughing, we noticed Jack had arrived and was walking over to our car. I started to get out. <clears throat> hold on, Dad said. I just want to make sure you've forgiven me, okay? Yes, I forgive you. He looked at me gratefully. Thank you. But don't ever throw anything else of mine out again without telling me. I promise. I opened the door and got out just as Jack reached the car. Hey, Jack, I said. Hey, Augie. Hey, Mr. Pullman, said Jack. How you doing, Jack, said Dad. See you later, Dad, I said, closing the door. Good luck, guys, Dad called out, rolling down the front window. See you on the other side of fifth grade. We waved as he turned on the ignition and started to pull away, but then I ran over and he stopped the car. I put my head in the window so Jack couldn't hear what I was saying. Can you guys not kiss me a lot after graduation? I asked quietly. It's kind of embarrassing. I'll try my best. Tell mom too. I don't think she'll be able to resist Augie, but I'll pass it along. Bye, dear old dad. He smiled again. Bye, my son, my son. Take your seats, everyone. Jack and I walked right behind a couple of sixth graders into the building and then followed them to the auditorium. Mrs. G was at the entrance, handing out the programs and telling kids where to go. Fifth graders down the aisle to the left, she said. Sixth graders go to the right. Everyone come in, come in. Good morning. Go to your staging areas. Fifth graders to the left, sixth graders to the right. The auditorium was huge inside. Big sparkly chandeliers, red velvet walls, rows and rows and rows of cushioned seats leading up to the giant stage. We walked down the wide aisle, followed the signs to the fifth grade staging area, which was in a big room to the left of the stage. Inside were four rows of folding chairs facing the front of the room, which is where Miss Reuben was standing, waving us in as soon as we walked in the room. Okay, kids, take your seats, she was saying, pointing to the rows of chairs. Don't forget you're sitting alphabetically. Come on, everybody, take your seats. Not too many kids had arrived yet, though, and the ones who had weren't listening to me, I mean, listening to her. Me and Jack were sword fighting with our rolled up programs. Hey guys, it was Summer walking over to us. She was wearing a light pink dress and I think a little makeup. Wow, Summer, you look awesome, I told her, because she really did. Really? Thanks, you do too, Augie. Yeah, you look okay, Summer, said Jack kind of matter-of-factly, and for the first time I realized that Jack had a crush on her. This is so exciting, isn't it, said Summer. Yeah, kind of, I answered, nodding. Oh man, look at this program, said Jack, scratching his forehead. We're gonna be here all day. I looked at my program. Headmaster's opening remarks, Dr. Harold Jansen. Middle school director's address, Mr. Lawrence P Tushman. L Light and day, middle school choir. Fifth grade student commencement address, Zamina Chin. Pasha Bell, Canon and D, middle school chamber music ensemble. ensemble. Sixth grade student commencement address, Mark Antoniak. Under pressure, middle school choir. Middle School Dean's Address, Ms. Jennifer Rubin. Awards Presentation, C. Back. Roll Call of Names. Why do you think that, I asked. Because Mrs. Mr. Jansen's speeches go on forever, said Jack. He's even worse than Tushman. My mom said she actually dozed off when he spoke last year, Summer added. What's the awards presentation, I asked. That's where they give medals to the biggest brainiacs, Jack answered, which would mean Charlotte and Zamina will win everything in the fifth grade, like they won everything in the fourth grade and in the third grade. Not in the second grade, I laughed. They didn't give those awards out in the second grade, he answered. Maybe you'll win this year, I joked. Not unless they give awards for the most C's, I la he laughed. Everybody take your seats, Mrs. Rubin started yelling louder now, like she was getting annoyed that nobody was listening. We have a lot to get through, so take your seats. Don't forget you're sitting in alphabetical order. A through G is the first row. H through N is the second row. O through Q is the third row. R through Z is the last row. Let's go, people. We should go sit down, said Summer, walking toward the front section. You guys are definitely coming over to my house after this, right? I called out after her. Definitely, she said, taking her seat next to Zamina Chin. 
When did summer get so hot, Jack muttered in my ear. Shut up, dude, I said, laughing as we headed toward the third row. Seriously, when did that happen, he whispered, taking the seat next to mine. Mr. Will, Ms. Rubin shouted, last time I checked, W came between R and Z. Yes? Jack looked at her blankly. Dude, you're in the wrong row, I said. I am? And the face he made as he got up to leave, which was a mixture of looking completely confused and looking like he's just played a joke on someone, totally cracked me up. A simple thing. About an hour later, we were all seated in the giant auditorium waiting for Mr. Tishman to give his middle school address. The auditorium was even bigger than I imagined it would be, bigger even than the one at Via's school. I looked around and there must have been a million people in the audience. Okay, maybe not a million, but definitely a lot. Thank you, Headmaster Jansen, for those very kind words of introduction, said Mr. Tishman, standing behind the podium on the stage as he talked into the microphone. Welcome my fellow teachers and members of the faculty. Welcome parents and grandparents, friends and honored guests, and most especially, welcome to my fifth and sixth grade students. Welcome to the feature prep middle school graduation ceremonies. Everyone applauded. Every year, continued Mr. Tishman, reading from his notes with his reading glasses way down to the tip of his nose, I am charged with writing two commencement addresses, one for the fifth and sixth grade graduation ceremony today, and one for the seventh and eighth grade ceremony that will take place tomorrow. And every year I say to myself, let me cut down on my work and write just one address that I can use for both situations. Seems like it shouldn't be such a hard thing to do, right? And yet each year I still end up with two different speeches, no matter what my intentions, and I finally figured out why this year. It's not as you might assume, simply because tomorrow I'll be talking to an older crowd with a middle school experience that is largely behind them, whereas your middle school experience is largely in front of you. No, I think it has to do more with this particular age that you are right now, this particular moment in your lives that even after 20 years of my being around students this age still moves me. Because you're at the cusp, kids, you're at the edge between childhood and everything that comes after. You're in transition. We are all gathered here together, Mr. Tishman continued, taking off his glasses and using them to point at all of us in the audience all your families, friends, and teachers to celebrate not only your achievements of this past year, feature middle schoolers, but your endless possibilities. When you reflect on this past year, I want you all to look at where you are now and where you've been. You've all gotten a little taller, a little stronger, a little smarter, I hope. Here, some people in the audience chuckled, but the best way to measure how much you've grown isn't by inches or the number of laps you can now run around the track or even your grade point average though those things are important to be sure. It's what you've done with your time, how you've chosen to spend your days and whom you have touched this year. That to me is the greatest measure of success. There's a wonderful line in a book by J.M. Barry, and no, it's not Peter Pan, and I'm not going to ask you to clap if you believe in fairies. Everyone laughed again. But in another book by J.M. Barry called The Little White Bird, he writes, he started flipping through a small book on the podium until he found the page he was looking for, and then he put on his reading glasses. Shall we make a new rule of life? Always to try to be a little kinder than necessary. Here Mr. Tushman looked up at the audience. Kinder than is necessary, he repeated. What a marvelous line, isn't it? Kinder than is necessary, because it's not enough to be kind. One should be kinder than needed. Why I love that line, that concept, is that it reminds me that we carry with us as human beings not just the capacity to be kind, but the very choice of kindness. And what does that mean? How is that measured? You can't use a yardstick. It's like I was saying just before. It's not like measuring how much you've grown in a year. It's not exactly, exactly quantifiable, is it? How do we know we've been kind? What is being kind anyway? He put on his reading glasses again and started flipping through another small book. There's another passage in a different book I'd like to share with you, he said. If you'll bear with me while I find it. Ah, here we go. In Under the Eye of the Clock by Christopher Nolan, the main character is a young man who is facing some extraordinary challenges. There's this one part where someone helps him, a kid in his class. On the surface, it's a small gesture, but to this young man whose name is Joseph, it's, well, if you'll permit me. He cleared his throat and read from the book. It was at moments such as these that Joseph recognized the face of God in human form. It glimmered in their kindness to him. It showed in their keenness. It hinted in their caring. Indeed, it caressed their in their gaze. He paused and took off his reading glasses again. 
It glimmered in their kindness to him, he repeated, smiling. Such a simple thing, kindness, such a simple thing. A nice word of encouragement given when needed, an act of friendship, a passing smile. He closed the book, put it down, and leaned forward on the podium. Children, what I want to impart to you today is an understanding of the value of that simple thing called kindness. And that's all I want to leave you with today. I know I'm kind of infamous for my um, verbosity. Here, everybody laughed again. I guess he knew he was known for his long speeches. But what I want you, my students, to take away from your middle school experience, he continued, is the sure knowledge that in the future you make for yourselves anything is possible. If every single person in this room made it a rule that wherever you are, whenever you can, you will try to act a little kinder than is necessary, the world will really would be a better place. And if you do this, if you act just a little kinder than is necessary, someone else somewhere someday may recognize in you and every single one of you the face of God. He paused and shrugged or whatever politically correct spiritual representation of universal goodness you happen to believe in, he added quickly, smiling, which got a lot of laughs and loads of applause, especially from the back of the auditorium where the parents were sitting. Awards. I liked Mr. Tishman's speech, but I have to admit, I kind of zoned out a little during some of the other speeches. I tuned in again as Miss Rubin started reading off the names of the kids who had made the high honor roll because we were supposed to stand when our names were called. So I waited and listened for my name as she went down the list alphabetically. Reed King Kingsley, Maya Markowitz, August Pullman. I stood up. Then when she finished reading off the names, she asked us all to face the audience and take a bow and everyone applauded. I had no idea where in that huge crowd my parents might be sitting. All I could see were the flashes of light from people taking photos and parents waving at their kids. I pictured mom waving at me from somewhere even though I couldn't see her. Then Mr. Tushman came back to the podium to present the medals for academic excellence, and Jack was right. Zamina Chin won the gold medal for overall academic excellence in the fifth grade. Charlotte won the silver. Charlotte also won a gold medal for music. Amos won the medal for overall excellence in sports, which I was really happy about because ever since the nature retreat, I considered Amos to be like one of my best friends in school. But I was really, really thrilled when Mr. Tushman called out Summer's name for the gold medal in creative writing. I saw Summer put her hand over her mouth when her name was called, and when she walked up onto the stage, I yelled, Woohoo, Summer! as loudly as I could, though I don't think she heard me. After the last name was called, all the kids who had just won awards stood next to each other on stage, and Mr. Tushman said to the audience, Ladies and gentlemen, I am very honored to present to you this year's Beecher Prep School Scholastic Achievers. Congratulations to all of you. I applauded as the kids on stage bowed. I was so happy for summer. The final award this morning, said Mr. Tushman, after the kids on stage had returned to their seats, is the Henry Ward Beecher, Beecher Medal to honor students who have been notable or exemplary in certain areas throughout the school year. Typically, this medal has been our way of acknowledging volunteerism or service to the school. I immediately figured Charlotte would get this medal because she organized the coat drive this year. So I kind of zoned out a bit again. I looked at my watch, 1056. I was getting hungry for lunch already. Henry Be Ward Beecher was, of course, the 19th century abolitionist and fiery sermonizer for human rights after whom this school was named, Mr. Tushman was saying when I started paying attention again. While reading up on his life in preparation for this award, I came upon a passage that he wrote that seemed particularly consistent with the themes I touched on earlier, themes I've been ruminating upon all year long. Not just the nature of kindness, but the nature of one's kindness, the power of one's friendship, the test of one's character, the strength of one's courage. And here, the weirdest thing happened. Mr. Tushman's voice cracked a bit like he got all choked up. He actually cleared his throat and took a big sip of water. I started paying attention for real now to what he was saying. The strength of one's courage, he repeated quietly, nodding and smiling. He held up his right hand like he was counting off. Courage, kindness, friendship, character. These are the qualities that define us as human beings and propel us on occasion to greatness. And that is what the Henry Ward Beecher Medal is all about, recognizing greatness. But how do we do that? How do we measure something like greatness? Again, there's no yardstick for that kind of thing. How do we even define it? Well, Beecher actually had an answer for that. He put his reading glasses on again, leafed through a book, and started to read. 
greatness, wrote Beecher, lies not in being strong, but in the right using of strength. He is the greatest whose strength carries up the most hearts. Again, out of the blue, he got all choked up. He put his two index fingers over his mouth for a second before continuing. He is the greatest, he finally continued, whose strength carries up the most hearts by the attraction of his own. Without further ado, this year I am very proud to award the Henry Ward Beecher Medal to the student whose quiet strength has carried up the most hearts. So, will August Pullman please come up here to receive this award? Floating. People started applauding before Mr. Tishman's words actually registered in my brain. I heard Maya, who was next to me, give a little happy scream when she heard my name, and Miles, who was on the other side of me, patted my back. Stand up, get up, all the kids around, said all the kids around me. And I felt lots of hands pushing me upward out of my seat, guiding me to the edge of the road, patting my back, high-fiving me. Way to go, Augie, nice going, Augie. I even started hearing my name being chanted, Augie, Augie. Augie. I looked back and saw Jack leading the chant, fist in the air, smiling and signaling for me to keep going, and Amos shouting through his hands, Woohoo, little dude! Then I saw Summer smiling as I walked past her row, and when she saw me look at her, she gave me a secret little thumbs up and mouthed the silent cool beans to me. I laughed and shook my head a little, like I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it. I think I was smiling. Maybe I was beaming. I don't know. As I walked up the aisle toward the stage, all I saw was a blur of happy, bright faces looking at me and hands clapping for me, and I heard people yelling things out to me. You deserve it, Augie. Good for you, Augie. I saw all my teachers in the aisle seats, Mr. Brown, Miss Potosa, Mr. Roach, Miss Autonabi, and Nurse Molly, and all the others, and they were cheering for me, woohooing and whistling. I felt like I was floating. It was so weird, like the sun was shining full force on my face and the wind was blowing. As I got closer to the stage, I saw Ms. Rubin waving at me in the front row, and then next to her was Mrs. G, who was crying hysterically, a happy crying, smiling and clapping the whole time. And as I walked up the steps to the stage, the most amazing thing happened. Everyone started standing up. Not just the front rows, but the whole audience suddenly got up on their feet, whooping, hollering, clapping like crazy. It was a standing ovation for me. I walked across the stage to Mr. Tushman, who shook my hand with both his hands and whispered in my ear, well done, Augie. Then he placed the gold medal over my head, just like they do in the Olympics, and had me turn to face the audience. I, it felt like I was watching myself in a, in a movie, almost, like I was someone else. It was like that last scene in Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, when Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, and Chewbacca are being applauded for destroying the Death Star. I could almost hear the Star Wars theme music playing in my head as I stood on the stage. I wasn't even sure why I was getting this medal, really. No, that's not true. I knew why. It's like people you see sometimes and you can't imagine what it would be like to be that person, whether it's somebody in a wheelchair or somebody who can't talk. Only I know that I'm that person to other people, maybe to every single person in that whole auditorium. To me though, I'm just me, an ordinary kid. But hey, if they want to give me a medal for being me, that's okay, I'll take it. I didn't destroy a Death Star or anything like that, but I did just get through the fifth grade and that's not easy, even if you're not me. Pictures. Afterward, there was a reception for the fifth and sixth graders after a, under a huge white tent in the back of the school. All the kids found their parents and I didn't mind at all when mom and dad hugged me like crazy or when Via wrapped her arms around me and swung me left and right about 20 times. Then Papa and Tata hugged me and Aunt Kate and Uncle Poe and Uncle Ben. Everyone kind of teary-eyed and wet-cheeked, but Miranda was the funniest. She was crying more than anyone and squeezed me so tight that Via had to practically pry her off of me, which made them both laugh. Everyone started taking pictures of me and pulling out their flips, and then D Dad got me and Summer and Jack together for a group shot. We put our arms around each other's shoulders, and for the first time I can remember, I wasn't even thinking about my face. I was just smiling a big, fat, happy smile for all the different cameras clicking away at me. Flash, flash, click, click. Smiling away as Jack's parents and Summer's mom started clicking. Then Reed and Maya came over, flash, flash, click, click. And then Charlotte came over and asked if she could take a picture with us, and we were like, sure, of course. And then Charlotte's parents were snapping away at our little group along with everyone else's parents. And the next thing I knew, the two Maxes had come over, and Henry and Miles and Savannah. Then Amos came over and Zamina. And we were all in this big, tight huddle as parents clicked away like we were on a red carpet somewhere. 
Luca, Isaiah, Nino, Pablo, Tristan, Ellie. I lost track of who else came over. Everybody, practically. All I knew for sure is that we were all laughing and squeezing in tight against each other, and no one seemed to care if it was my face that was next to theirs or not. In fact, and I don't mean to brag here, but it kind of felt like everyone wanted to get close to me. The walk home. We walked to our house for cake and ice cream after the reception. Jack and his parents and his little brother Jamie, Summer and her mother, Uncle Poe and Aunt Kate, Uncle Ben, Tata and Papa, Justin and Via and Miranda, Mom and Dad. It was one of those great June days when the sky is completely blue and the sun is shining, but it isn't so hot that you wish you were on the beach instead. It was just the perfect day. Everyone was happy. I still felt like I was floating, the Star Wars hero music in my head. I walked with Summer and Jack, but we and we just couldn't stop cracking up. Everything made us laugh. We were in that giggly kind of mood where all someone has to do is look at you and you start laughing. I heard Dad's voice up ahead and looked up. He was telling everyone a funny story as they walked down Amesford Avenue. The grown-ups were all laughing too. It was like Mom always said, Dad could be a comedian. I noticed Mom wasn't walking with the group of grown-ups, so I looked behind me. She was hanging back a bit, smiling to herself like she was thinking of something sweet. She seemed happy. I took a few steps back and surprised her by hugging her as she walked. She put her arm around me and gave me a squeeze. Thank you for making me go to school, I said quietly. <sighs> she hugged me close and leaned down and kissed the top of my head. Thank you, Augie, she answered softly. For what? For everything you've been to, you've given us, she said. For coming into our lives, for being you. She bent down and whispered in my ear. You really are a wonder, Augie. You are a wonder. And that's the end. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you soon. Bye-bye.